Hi everyone, this is going to be a continuation of our series on the Mark of the Beast. What could it be? Where could it be lurking in, in uh, things that are going on even in our own country? Uh, so this is episode two, and we're going to discuss a presidential order to plan for a central bank digital currency, how that might be important. And we're going to uh, look at uh, somebody mentioning the trucker strike makes the point that this is dangerous to us. And that's going to be a interview that or a speech that Robert F. Kennedy Jr. gave. So this is a bi- bipartisan uh, thing that I think uh, Democrats and Republicans need to get together on and realize we are all going to lose our freedom if we're not very, very careful. Anyway, let's just look at the uh, biblical issues. Um, and I did this last time. And uh, we have the uh, book of Revelation 13, 16. And he causes all, this is the bad guy, does this, <laughs> causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in the right hand or in their foreheads. Okay, and we all know that that means you're going to, you're not going to be able to buy or sell, right? Well, where does that come? The very next verse. And that no man might buy or sell, save he had, he that had the mark. Or, so by the way, there's another way to get around if you don't have the mark. Or you had, or you have the name of the beast or the number of his name. So if you knew the name of the beast or the number of the name of the beast, you would be able to transact. So there's some aspect of digital information will allow you to transact. So that's what I was making point in the very first episode is there is obviously implied right in the Bible scriptures, a digital version to be able to get your food, get your buying and selling done, but you have to have the name of the beast. And like I said, what if the code is B-E-A-S-T? I'm, I'm saying it humorously. Hey, and what if the number is 666, right? So, but somehow it's a digital information, letters or numbers, and numbers actually. And then uh, we're told, here is wisdom. Let him that has understanding count the number of the beast, for it is a number of a man, and his number is 666. So there's a lot of speculation what that could be, and I'm not going to go there. I'm just here to say, what do we as Christians, looking at the political landscape, what, where should we stand on certain things that are coming up and, and changes that people are trying to propose? All right. Well, what, we're, what we should be concerned about is uh, something called, according to Robert F. Kennedy Jr., so I'm just going to let him speak about it in a little bit. But there's this new idea of a United States digital currency. And this is how Investopedia is summarized in the Google hit when you hit it. A U.S. C- BDC. That's uh, central bank digital currency. So we're right there. Right there. It's central. <laughs> okay. It's not like your local bank. It's a central bank. Will be the digital or electronic form of the dollar that acts as a legal tender and is regulated by the government. So they're intending this will now become a legal tender. And do not take that away from, excuse me, make sure you keep that in your mind that this would be the legal tender. It would be not pieces of paper. Or nor would it be coin, it would be some digital information in a computer somewhere that could be deleted, altered, or suspended, or controlled against your will. <laughs> okay, so you don't go in and you, you're not in control of it. It's at a central bank. A U.S. CBDC will act as a supplement to existing forms of payment. Okay, so now what they're trying to say is we're not going to take over all forms of payment, and you could still have U.S. dollars, which is important. But I'm going to show you there's a problem even with U.S. dollars. And that's another thing we need to probably rectify eventually, somehow, some way. I don't know. Take a miracle. I'll talk to you about it in a second. Identity verification, intermediaries, and privacy protection are required parts of launching a CBDC. So in other words, they want to allow an identification of who you are. So you can't have a secret name or just use a password or encrypt your name so nobody knows what your real name is. So they're right there, you know, you don't have privacy. When it says identify identity verification, it means you can't you can't hide your identity, okay? Which unlike in other situations, particularly when countries become totalitarian, what do you think people have to do? They have to hide their identity when they store and keep things separate, trying to survive during a ter- tyrannical totalitarian system. So this isn't going to allow, to, if the government turns totalitarian using this these techniques, You have no way out because they've made you not able to transact in your own currency electronically unless you can do an identity verification. Now, that identity verification may very well be the, what did I say, the name or the number of the beast. So you may have to get approval that you can even exist as a human being 
and you can only operate and live, buy and sell, if you also accept the name or the uh, a number of the name of the beast, and that is affixed to your name. So it's, you know, Bob666 and Jane666, so on and so forth. So you'll be given a special identifier. Um, okay, so then it says privacy protection are required. So they're going to use the word privacy and make you think that giving up your identity doesn't affect your right of privacy. Hmm. Very clever. Government is always on your side. Now, uh, this was a subject of an executive order of the president in March of 2022. That's about a year, almost a year. Oh, oops. My, my mouse seems to move on its own. In March of 2022, that's now is right now May of 2023. So this is a year and a month or so earlier. And, um, a Texas A&M finance professor gives a look at the cryptocurrency landscape. So that's who Caitlin Clark is. Uh, she's at the Texas A&M University Division of Marketing and Communication. And she mentions in this, uh, she's analyzing what's the impact on cryptocurrency, but I don't really care about that. Uh, and I don't own any Bitcoin, nor am I recommending anyone buy it. I don't know if it's good. I don't know if it's bad. It could be, could be fantastic. I don't know. But uh, what I recommend, just so you know, is Buy some silver coins, bury them in the ground, keep a little treasure map to find it. That's what people have done for thousands of years. Uh, you just take your precious metals, put them where uh, uh, you alone can find them in the dirt. And that's it. That's that's the best bank for uh, when you're under totalitarian rule. Uh, okay, so what she says here, notably the order, the presidential order, also calls for the exploration of a potential digital version of the U.S. dollar. If this were to happen, how would it change the landscape? The executive order asks to explore a U.S. central bank digital currency, a CBDC, which is a digital form of the U.S. dollar. I'm glad she says that, admittedly, because you're going to see why that's a problem. CBDC is a what? Centralized cryptocurrency, unlike other cryptocurrencies. So all cryptocurrencies uh, are not alike. And the Bitcoin, as I understand it, is decentralized so that it uh, anybody can look up their own transactions in sort of a, I don't even know how it works, but somehow it's not centralized. That's all I know. Let's keep going. Okay. And one of the things I think that uh, is always left out of uh, modern media, journalism, is why don't you consult with lawyers sometimes when a major legal issue is being presented by a fiat of the president of the United States that might be might be touched on in the U.S. Constitution, just maybe a little bit. Anyway, so uh, being a lawyer, I care about the Constitution, and I think every citizen in the United States should know the Constitution and should uh, be more familiar with it because this is how you protect yourself from tyranny. Okay, and you're going to see we've already failed here. You're going to laugh when I tell you what's what's unconstitutional in a second. Article 1, Section 8, Clause 5. The Congress shall have power to coin money, regulate the value thereof and of foreign coin, and fix the standard of weights and measures. Does Congress, now reading that, ladies and gentlemen, do you think Congress has the right to print money? No. Do they have the, run to, the right to create what's called fiat currency? We assign a value to not coin, but to a piece of paper. And, and by the way, if you don't know what the U.S. dollar is, it's a piece of paper. It's all it is. It's worth a couple cents, <laughs> three cents, four cents. But it costs a little bit more than that to make each, each uh, piece of paper. But the paper itself is valueless. It could be, uh, it could, you, you know, if you didn't know it had any uh, exchange value, you could paper it on your wallpaper. it would be wallpaper and it would cost you about the same amount as you buy paper to print out of your printer on your computer. So it's valueless, essentially. It's pennies, pennies, each piece of paper. So what am I saying, Doug? <laughs> I'm saying that the U.S. currency system is obviously and always has been, and nobody can dispute it, an unconstitutional system. But it was accepted because it was an emergency when it was first developed. And guess where you find that out? Go to the U.S. Capitol website. <laughs> All right. So now if you go to the U.S. Capitol website, this is uh, what shows up. I, I actually, I just, I knew what uh, Lincoln did. It was called the Greenback. And so he uh, got, uh, many people say it was his in, in idea or invention. It was really forced on us, as you'll see. We, we ran out of any other options. 
as you'll see, and even it's explained here at the the um, the U.S. Capitol website. So this is where I'm getting this from. Uh, just let's look over here what it says. Greenbacks, named for their distinctive color, were the first national currency of the United States. The notes, though not redeemable for gold or silver, were lawful money backed by the credit of the federal government. So just ha so you know, is that the entire concept of the, the, the uh, let's go back one step here. If you go back here, we were regu we we had to coin money. So coin was always two types of things, uh, and they were always had to be precious metals, silver or gold. There was no such thing as a piece of of uh, copper that's valueless. I mean pennies, as even a currency. But I guess you you could say maybe you could use a penny or so, a copper, but that was never considered a real currency even in ancient times. So gold and silver, okay. And if you did it right, you would never run out of gold and silver because you just keep mining it. And it's, you, you know, we have a lot of gold and silver in the United States and gold, gold and silver mines are going on still to this day. So we would continually have been adding to gold and silver. And as long as you did what? Regulate the value thereof and don't inflate, you know, don't inflate its value. Don't keep assigning higher iron values to it. You never would run out of gold and silver. So it's not an impractical thing at all. But... What happens is when you're in the war, what, what's the, what do you have to do when you're in war? You have to buy things. Well, if you were buying it from your neighbor in the United States, that's not a problem. But what if you have to ship it abroad? So we want to buy boats and ships and guns and ammo. And we got to buy it from England and Spain and France. What are you going to do? You've got to ship all this gold and silver on ships and get it across the <laughs> to the other side. And then you got to bring back the guns, the ammo and the weapons and the boats. So that's what happened. It became an emergency, and I'm going to show you what happened. So here, if you look on this page on the left here, from gold to greenbacks, there's a very indistinguishable paragraph. So what I did is I cropped it, and I blew it up so we can read it together. Very important. The 37th Congress, 1861 to 1863, faced a financial crisis in 1862. A spiraling cost of war rapidly depleted the Union's reserves of what? Paper dollars that other people would give us credit abroad? No, it was called gold and silver coin. The only legal tender of the United States. So I, I should mention that's the Constitution says the only legal tender is gold and silver. After intense debate, Congress authorized the issuance of paper U.S. notes, popularly called greenbacks, declaring them lawful money for all payments except interest on public debt and import duties. Was that constitutional? No, because the only legal tender is gold and silver. But, but what are we doing? It's an emergency. It's a lot like COVID. We have an emergency. We can suspend all legal rights. You don't have to, you can't go to school anymore. You can't worship at church anymore because it's an emergency. So emergencies are the, the uh, mothers of all <laughs> violations of civil rights if it becomes an endemic change in the way we live. So COVID is finally going away. We finally can go to church again. We can finally speak freely. We don't have to wear masks, all this stuff. Uh, and so we were willing to live in a totalitarian society for our own benefit and to protect one another. And so that's what we did for a couple of years. And now we're back to much greater freedom. But anytime they need to, they're going to run another emergency bias and constrict our rights. We've got to be prepared for these things. But this this emergency has never gone away. And that's the problem. The Legal Tender Act intended as an emergency measure dramatically extended federal powers and changed the nation's, well, here, I got to go back so I can read the word, and changed the nation's monetary standard. So literally, it wasn't constitutionally changed from gold and silver to pieces of paper that were colored green. It was simply changed by a legal, excuse me, the Legal Tender Act, which is unconstitutional if anybody wanted to sit back and bring an action and ask a judge and judge said, well, you know what? There's been how many hundreds of years and no one's brought this up. Yeah. Nobody's brought it up. That's true. doesn't make it constitutional though. Time does not heal all wounds. So if one day this has to be resolved, but we're now $37 trillion in debt. And I'm going to explain a little bit about that. I think, I think Americans, you know, I learned stuff in law school. I want to share with you in a minute. And, and, and I think Americans need to know how our banking system works, but I won't get there in a minute. So let's look at this. States are, this is a YouTube video uh, from four days ago. States are banning CBDCs. Florida and Indiana passed laws banning central bank digital currencies. Now, that's an interesting thing is, um, is 
currency something that is vital to interstate trade? If it is, then Congress could have a commerce power to determine certain things are valuable in interstate commerce. Is that a way around the Constitution? No, because it really doesn't. It clearly deals with legal tender throughout the United States as being silver and gold, and the Congress would have the right to regulate its value, but cannot basically create value out of paper, which is what it did in the Legal Tender Act in an emergency, which has long since gone away. So anyway, that's the thing. So this is what I would say as Americans, if you have uh, an ability to advocate or you're in the public eye and you're a governor, you're a a person who's able to influence um, uh, proposals on on legislature, we need to all get together. And as a first step to keeping our, our currency as constitutional as possible, we need to stop this idea of a central bank a digital currency. It's just a, it's even an end around, if you ask me, around making sure that if you want to go to the store, you can hand pieces of dollars that don't track you, that you bought something. You know, so like let's say you're going to church and you're donating money to church, you can put it in the in the, in the thing if you want secretly. You, you know, it doesn't get tracked because it's a piece of paper. But if it's your uh, if there's some electronic tracking that's necessary in every transaction that you can't do anything free of any digital record of what, where, uh, how it went from you and where it went, then you have no freedom of expression that somebody, if they become totalitarian and say, uh, you know, we're, co- we're creating an emergency COVID thing forever <laughs> and you can't go to church anymore, but you want to go to church. You can't anymore because this is going to block you because if you do, I mean, you not go to church. You could go to church, but you can't support what you believe in. You can't give money. You can't donate money unless it's, you, you know, you're willing to have a tract and maybe they've done something also to interfere with your, your uh, freedom of religion in a particular faith. So this is all, uh, uh, you know, things that why our structure was made to prevent abuse because the British crown had been abusive towards Americans, particularly on taxation without representation. And that was why they wanted to destroy the stamps. Uh, there was a, uh, the Stamp Act was to um, t- tax, <laughs> you won't believe this. If you wanted to write a piece of paper as an attorney, this is only applied to attorneys, by the way. So the attorneys wanted to write a will. So you need five pieces of paper, right? But every page you had to get a stamp from the government. You could have the page written on. <laughs> and that's that stamp had maybe it's $5. I'm just making this stuff up. So now to write a four page will would cost, you know, $5 times $4. So that'd be $20 in theory. U- UK currency is different, by the way. I'm just using uh, numbers we can relate to. And then you know, the lawyers went up in arms, you know, we, 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 who's going to pay us $20 just to do the currency, to do the paper, let alone pay our, for our services. So, you know, they, they're going all upset. So this is, this is how you uh, create tyranny. And that's what we were fighting against. That's why you have all these rules about what, you know, it has to be coin, legal tender and all this other stuff. I digress. All right. Now, uh, I want to show you an interview of, um, well, actually, I want to show you first the interview, I think, of RFK Jr. So let's take a look at that, and I'll be right back. Okay, we're going to play this clip from Robert F. Kennedy Jr. at a recent conference uh, where he was advocating the protection of the right to have Bitcoin. Again, I'm not an advocate of Bitcoin. I don't know anything about it, so I can't advocate anything about it. And he refers back to the trucker strike as proof of of, of having a a currency that can be completely controlled by the government where your bank accounts can be frozen is going to ultimately infringe upon free speech. It's totalitarian. And um, so I'm going to let him explain what he thinks. But uh, I already dealt with this in the prior video. Okay, so please take a look and listen. As most of you know, that trucker strike was a peaceful demonstration of people who were demanding rights that are sacred and are taken for granted for every American. The the right to be free of government mandates, the right for free assembly, the right for free speech, uh, the right to petition our government, all of those things that we take for granted. And nonetheless, and it was a peaceful demonstration, nonetheless, the Canadian government fiercely repressed the truckers' protest. 
government officials declared a state of emergency. They suppressed free speech. Perhaps most alarmingly, they froze the bank accounts of hundreds of protesters and their supporters, which they identified using surveillance and data monitoring technologies. Some of these lawful and peaceful protesters, none of these lawful and peaceful protesters had violated any law. They had not been charged, and they certainly had not been convicted. It, but suddenly they found that they could not access their money, their bank accounts, to pay their mortgages or to feed their families. When I witnessed this cataclysm, this, this devastating use of, of government repression, I realized for the first time how free money is as important to freedom as free expression. And By the way, he, he said something I didn't realize and didn't think about is these truckers uh, were being identified and the people who were there and the protesters who were there were identified in part by surveillance, just exactly as China does on its citizens, just scans their faces and then runs it through a database and then they know who you are and then they tr track it back to your bank. So there's literally no right of privacy in a sense over your face. So they're using that little element but nobody in the past, like like for eternity of people living on Earth, no one assumed that just walking out in public was a way of disclosing your identity. Somebody would have to ask your, your name, your ID. But the government now has these machines called surveillance devices that can now <laughs> invade your even your privacy, your identity in public. Now, I just want to say this to you. It used to be, and it is still true in California law, that I cannot take a picture of you, an image of you, without violating your personal rights. So if, I don't know if you ever noticed in some movies, they'll black out people in the background or they're black, they'll blur their faces and all that. That's because of the California statute was operative in that particular jurisdiction where that was happening. And that's actually to protect the right of privacy. So I actually think we should stop surveillance of just ordinary citizens going down the street being surveilled. Ex exactly what we saw in the episode last time on Beast episode number one, where we see in China they're, they're tracked and, and they literally their names are, are tracking along with them. It tells whoever's looking at the monitor, their age, their date, their place of birth, what they do for a living. It all comes up on a computer. I'm sure they can click a button. They can see all of your identity. That is way, way beyond belief. Uh, that, that the, and it's a violation of your right to privacy, even if you're in public, because I haven't opened my wallet. I haven't shown my identification to anybody. I don't have to. And you don't have a right to scan and fill me. This is a problem, by the way, all arising out of the 9-11 attack. And someday we need to revisit all of that. Again, that was an emergency and, and it got blown out of proportion. Uh, you know, every kind of violation of civil rights, tapping our all our Americans' phones, that's what that, uh, Snowden showed us was happening and, and still is going on. It never got resolved because we've we've had government after government going after him rather than saying, hey, he's a hero for telling us that all of our all of our phone calls, ladies and gentlemen, are recorded and put in an OCR database, they're scanned to get all the words out and they put them away. And I, and I know there's some justification that you can prevent any crime on earth if you had enough time to scan all of that for dangerous words. And that's what they do. And, and on the surface, it sounds like a good thing, but it means that they have every conversation that we're making, period. That's what Snowden proved. And he was a contractor for the CAA and he disclosed something he's not supposed to, but that's a fact of life. And somehow we've still not even resolved that. Anyway, but I, I digress. The point is this, is this is uh, currency is the way to control people. And that's what Mr. Uh, RFK Jr. is saying. And that's what uh, happened in the, tr in the trucker strike. And they supplemented that by using invasive means of identifying a person through their face visible in public, but not by asking them for their identification and doing it on a legitimate basis where they have, a, if they had of a right, maybe they don't have a right. Maybe your right of free speech in, in an assembly doesn't require me to tell you who I am. As long as I'm doing nothing criminal, I just want to protest. I want to put my face, my public body out there to protest something that's going on. So again, we, we have been told to just allow every erosion of civil rights imaginable. We need to push back. So anyway, uh, now that's what, uh, what RFK Jr. said. Now I want to let you hear something that Ron DeSantis said. I'm 
I'm no supporter of Ron DeSantis. I'm no advocate of Ron DeSantis, nor am I an opponent of Ron DeSantis. Um, I, I'm just telling you he's saying something that's wise, and that's all I care about. President Biden and the media are excited that the dollar could go digital. Central bank digital currencies. The world is going to see a functioning CBDC very soon. A CBDC that's a national digital currency controlled by the feds. When you use your wallet to pay for something, the Fed would take the digital cash out of your wallet and deposit it into the merchants. I think it'd be a total disaster. Sometimes government does things that may appear to be benevolent, but really are kind of like a wolf in sheep's clothing. This is a wolf coming as a wolf. For months, I tried to get Governor Ron DeSantis to do an interview. The government's plan for digital money got him to say yes. The media make it sound like it's a great thing. <laughs> Well, uh, if you don't care about your privacy and you want the government to have even more control over the economy, then maybe it is. But if you uh, don't trust uh, central authority, then you should see this immediately as something that is very problematic. But a lot of people do trust central authority. I'll read from the president's executive order on responsible development of digital assets. This will protect consumers, investors, and the environment. That last one's a tell because I think they would impose certain criteria. You bought another firearm? No, no, no. And if you do buy or do the wrong thing, they can easily cut off your money. Freedom! Freedom! That's what Canada's government did when these truckers protested vaccine rules. If your truck is being used in these protests, your corporate accounts will be frozen. When the government did block their bank accounts, that stopped the protests. Control over an American digital dollar would give our government even more power. They want to impose ideology through the economy. DeSantis is so upset about this plan for a digital dollar, he just persuaded Florida's legislature to ban its use in his state. This will be a national issue. Why is it the business of a governor? Look, this is part of our role. There's a back and forth between the federal government and the states, and so we're pushing back against things we don't think are good. What we did at the state level is protect Floridians against a unilateral action by either Treasury or the Federal Reserve. They do not have the authority to do that. He says what the Fed is doing may not even be legal. The Federal Reserve has come out and said, we would only do it after, quote, consulting with the legislative and executive branches. Ideally, we'd get specific congressional authorization. Wait a minute. It's not ideal that you get congress. That's what the Constitution requires. The advocates make a digital currency sound so good. As trusted as cash, as convenient as a payment app, yet also benefit from the same blockchain technology which underpins cryptocurrencies. Make cross-border payments easier, promote financial inclusion, <laughs> and payment system stability. When I started talking about some of the dangers from privacy and all that, the corporate press, all these outlets, they all of a sudden started converging that DeSantis is trying to promote conspiracy theories. They basically hate you. Part of that is true, but I think part of it is this is something that they care about. And the question is, why would these organizations care so much about a central bank digital currency? Is it really because they are really that invested in cross-border transactions? Of course not. It's because this is something that could help them advance their ideology of having more central authority and more supervisory power over the average American. But if the Fed doesn't develop its own digital currency, America's gonna fall behind, Wall Street Journal. The US financial system is still pretty old school when it comes to moving money around. And that's not a great way to run a modern global economy. Oh, please, they wanna to move to a cashless society, which would basically mean the Federal Reserve, Treasury Department, would have supervisory jurisdiction over all of your transactions. It's true that sometimes people use cash to buy illegal things, but cash has advantages. Cash is independence. Yeah, you have the cash in your wallet, you can go, you can make these transactions. It's not dependent on somebody else. It's uh, private. It's private. So is cryptocurrency. It lets people buy things without government money. Some in government don't like that. Legitimate digital public money could help drive out bogus digital private money. She clearly would be somebody that, that rejects 
any type of digital asset that's not controlled by a central authority. They don't like Bitcoin. They don't like some of these other things. And the reason is they don't control it. That's why they don't like it. Okay, so that'll uh, bring us to our conclusion. And uh, so what uh, I think we can see is the proposals for having a central bank digital currency in the United States, which uh, has been going on, proposed by Biden back in uh, March of 2022, is probably getting very close to being uh, implemented soon. And while it might not even be the only form of the U.S. dollar we're able to use, it's going to be opening the door that this is what people get used to. And it'll lead to the elimination of having paper currency and they'll claim that's going to wipe out all of the drug dealers. And uh, so they'll give you a good reason why you want to see that you have no means anymore of accessing cash in physical form. That'll be step one. And then uh, when that's done, then can you have your bank's digital banking work uh, independent of the CBDC? Eventually they'll erode that so that you really every transaction you make will now be recorded at the federal level. And they can turn your right to use your money off at any moment they want. Okay, so that's not what we want, right? So uh, I think we need to t advocate to our public officials to do it exactly what Florida and I think it was uh, Indiana have done, which is to ban the use of CBDCs in their states. And, uh, and if somebody says it's unconstitutional, they're trying to ban that. Well, I'd say it's unconstitutional to even have a CBDC under the U.S. Constitution because you can only, the only valid legal currency is gold or silver, and the Congress had the right to uh, regulate that, and that's it. And what we've gotten into is a monster out of control. And if, as Christians, we should not want to have these type of controls that could eventually uh, impinge on our religious freedom, which uh, hasn't happened yet so far, but uh, in other countries around the world, there's impingement on uh, people following their faith in Christ. So we need to be concerned. Okay. God bless. Take care. Everybody. Ciao. Bye.